What has the Jubilee ever done for us? Welcome to London History at Home. Uh, my name's Rebecca and in this Platinum Jubilee year I thought I'd look back at past jubilees and celebrations of monarchs' reigns. The first official jubilee was George III's Golden Jubilee in 1809. George III was our longest reigning king. Other monarchs with long reigns did have celebrations of sorts before him, but didn't refer to them as jubilees. Medieval monarchs tended to celebrate winning a battle or an important political alliance disguised as a wedding, more than longevity of reign. Um, in the hurly-burly of medieval royal life, you might not want to necessarily remind people of your predecessor if you'd acquired the crown in a less than honourable way. And you might not even want to draw attention to the length of your reign in case somebody thought, oh, well, that's enough of that, I want to go. Um, it was all a bit cutthroat, literally, uh, in the medieval period. Having said that, in 1376, King Edward III celebrated his 50th year on the throne, his, his golden jubilee, although they didn't call it that. Um, there was a grand procession from the Tower of London to Smithfield where a jousting tournament was held, which lasted a week. The highlight of sort of medieval entertainment was a joisting tournament. His wife, uh, Philippa of Hainalt, died in 1369, so his mistress, Alice Perez, took part in the parade on at least one of the days when she presided over the day's joust dressed as the Lady of the Sun. Less than a hundred years later, a, a civil war, a kind of dynastic war known as the Wars of the Roses began, and monarchs changed so rapidly that nobody was going to have a chance for a jubilee celebration. The dawn of the Tudor period heralded the end of the Wars of the Roses, and the first two Tudor kings, Henry VII and Henry VIII, did love a bit of a joust and a bit of a tournament. They were still tended to be held to celebrate marriages or births or peace treaties or other diplomatic occasions, rather than anniversaries of the reign. Henry VII did have a portrait of himself commissioned in 1505. Uh, modern monarchs, well, Queen Victoria and Elizabeth II anyway, did have um, jubilee portraits made. But Henry VII's was probably to try and secure a marriage proposal to the daughter of the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I, rather than to mark his 20th year on the throne. His son, King Henry VIII, held several jousts. He loved a good joust. We, we, we have good details on some of them. We even have images of some of them. But none of them seem to have marked the anniversaries of his reign, so we can't call any of them a jubilee. The first Tudor monarch to conspicuously mark their accession was Queen Elizabeth I, um, but she didn't do anything so silly as to wait for her 25th year on the throne for a silver jubilee. She celebrated every year. Elizabeth I came to the throne on 17th of November 1558. And for the early part of her reign, Accession Day was marked by nothing more than church sermons. Um, after a rebellion to overthrow her and replace her with Mary, Queen of Scots, was quashed in 1569. This was up to include bonfires and bell ringing on Accession Day. And by around 1580, the annual celebration was much more elaborate, include in, included in London an accession day tilt, a jousting tournament. Uh, the joust took place at Whitehall Palace on 17th November every year, except once when an outbreak of plague in London caused it to be relocated. Anyone remember when Covid caused the relocation of the Queen's birthday? And in typical English bank holiday style, in 1599, the accession day tilt was um, deferred a couple of days because of foul weather. Always rains on a bank holiday. The jousts in the 16th century were preceded by a performance with a storyline that would always feature Queen Elizabeth I in a particularly flattering role. So they were a traditional part of accession day celebrations and were open to all, um, typically the lowest priced entry onto the tilt yard at Whitehall Palace, which is where Horse Guards Parade is now, was about a shilling, which is in, in modern day terms the equivalent of about £8, so a reasonably affordable. A familiar part of modern Accession Day and Jubilee, Jubilee Day celebrations is a gun salute. Uh, cannon salutes became a part of Accession Day celebrations in the 1580s, with Elizabethan explorers even firing off their guns while at sea. In 1585, Francis Drake gave a gun salute while exploring Cape Verde. I'm sure the locals were thrilled by that. And by 1597, we know that the Tower of London were performing gun salutes on Accession Day because there's a report of a poor man being killed. The 1588 Accession Day celebration featured another familiar part of modern jubilees, a parade. 
In part as celebration of the defeat of the Spanish Armada, the Queen rode in a chariot that was meant to bring to mind the chariots of ancient Rome, and it was decorated with a, a model of the imperial crown and a lion and a dragon, which are symbols of England and the City of London. The parade finished at St Paul's Cathedral for a service of thanksgiving. This would have been the pre-fire, old St Paul's Cathedral. Modern jubilees, though, go to a thanksgiving service at St Paul's, Wren's, 17th century St Paul's. Another aspect of the Accession Day celebrations that Elizabeth I enjoyed was called the Royal Entry, or Triumphal Entry. Usually, once a year, a monarch would travel the country in what was known as the Royal Progress, when aristocrats across the land dreaded the royal entourage staying with them because feeding, housing and entertaining them could easily bankrupt you. At the end of the Royal Progress, the monarch returned to London and entered London with a great parade. There were temporary arches built and stops with dignitaries giving speeches and performances. Elizabeth I always timed her triumphal entry, so it was right before Accession Day, uh, making it a huge, great big holiday. The celebration of the accession of Queen Elizabeth I on the 17th of November became known as Queen's Day um, after she died and was still marked in, Eliz in England for the next 300 years, often with parades and bonfires. Nobody really does it now. Elizabeth I died in 1603, and the crown passed to her cousin, King James VI of Scotland, who became King James I of England. James continued the accession day tilts, and he was actually the last monarch to have a proper triumphal entry into London. We've even got some pictures of the arches, the temporary arches that were built. Subsequent monarchs entered London, of course, but there was just less fanfare. There was no triumphal entry. James VI and I's triumphal entry marked the first anniversary of his English reign. The plan had been to hold a triumphal entry when he entered London for the first time in 1603, but a plague outbreak meant that it was delayed to the following year, so kind of marking an anniversary of his reign. James loved a bit of pageantry and masks and balls, but marking jubilees is a bit complicated for him because he had acceded to the thrones of Scotland and England in different years. Um, he did celebrate his 50th year on the Scottish throne in 1617 by returning to Edinburgh Castle. When he'd left for England in 1603, he'd promised to return to Scotland every three years, but 1617 was the first and only time he made it back. He liked the bright lights of London too much. I haven't been able to find any specific celebrations for James I's 10th and 20th years on the English throne. There were huge celebrations in 1613, his 10th year on the English throne, torchlit parades and processions, but it was kind of in the older medieval royal tradition to celebrate the wedding of his daughter, not his own anniversary. Masks and plays were performed every year for King James I in January at Whitehall Palace. Nothing to do with the anniversary of his reign, but in 1623, a mask written by Ben Jonson and performed at the newly completed Banqueting House featured Saturn, the god of time, and the personification of fame, who discussed the passing of time with other characters. Perhaps a nod to the king's 20th year on the English throne and his 56 on the Scottish throne. James's grandson, King Charles II, was the next to make the anniversary of his accession more than a church sermon and a bit of bell ringing. Like James I, it's slightly tricky to pin down a good date for Charles II's accession. Ardent royalists would say he was king from 30th of January 1649, when his father, King Charles I, was executed. He was actually crowned at Schoon in Scotland on the 1st of January 1651. After England's Republic failed, Charles made promises from exile on the 1st of April 1660 that he wouldn't be too vindictive if he were offered the crown back. And on the 1st of May, he was invited back to take the throne. On the 8th of May, Parliament declared that Charles had actually always been king since 1649 and the past 11 years hadn't really happened. The new king arrived back in England on the 25th of May and entered London on the 29th of May, 1660, which was also his 30th birthday. The date of his return to London, 29th of May, was chosen as the day to celebrate his accession and was made a public holiday of Thanksgiving. The day came to be known as Oak Apple Day. It was traditional to wear oak apples or, or sprigs of oak leaves on the day. An oak apple, by the way, is not a fruit. It's a, a gall produced by wasps on oak trees. Um, the wearing of oak leaves referred to the Battle of Worcester in 1651, when Charles II escaped um, and hid in an oak tree to escape the parliamentary and army who were looking for him below. 
Oak Apple Day was celebrated during Charles II's reign with church bell ringing, bonfires, maypole dancing, Morris dancing, parties. In some places it became known as Pinch Day or, or, or Pinch Bum Day or Nettle Day, um, reflecting the punishments that were handed out to those not wearing oak leaves. Um, diarist Samuel Pepys recorded that in 1669 the king was at Whitehall Palace on Restoration Day and all was very gay and there was a fireworks display but, at Whitehall Palace but the celebrations mostly seem to have been street parties rather than big public events. The marking of Oak Apple Day continued after Charles II's reign although it began to wane in the 19th century and the public holiday was abolished in 1859. There are a few towns around England where it is celebrated, still, notably um, Founthorpe in Herefordshire, Castleton in Derbyshire and St Neot in Cornwall. And in London, the Royal Hospital Chelsea holds a kind of related ceremony each year called Founders Day, when a statue of the hospital's founder, King Charles II, is garlanded with oak leaves. We have to go through the rest of the Stuarts and a couple of Hanoverian kings before we get to the next monarch to celebrate the length of their reign. I mean, other monarchs had celebrated their own birthday and accessions just with gun salutes and bell ringing. But King George III um, was the next monarch to celebrate a jubilee, and in fact, the first to actually call it a jubilee. King George III is our longest reigning king, um, with a reign of uh, 59 years. Two of our queens have overtaken him. In 1809, it was decided to mark the 50th year of his reign and it was to be called the Golden Jubilee. It was announced that 25th of October, the anniversary of his accession, would be a holiday and that shops in London and some other towns and cities would close so as many people as possible would be able to have a day off. The king himself attended some events in Windsor, but he, he wasn't very well. Um, and so the royal appearances were mostly his wife, Queen Charlotte, and their daughters. They didn't go beyond, much beyond Windsor either. That's where the king was, because he was poorly. Um, but in Windsor there was a fete and fireworks, military parades, and the, the, this obelisk in Bachelor's Acre in Windsor commemorates the events in Windsor. In London, um, the Lord Mayor and, and the Guilds took part in a parade from Mansion House to St Paul's Cathedral. Uh, it featured the Lord Mayor's state coach and military bands and trumpeters and military groups and... All manner of sheriffs and constables and aldermen, all dressed in their best togs and travelling in decorated carriages and the horses had ribbons decorating them and all sorts of things. There were gun salutes and military displays on Horse Guards Parade and Hyde Park with the soldiers on Horse Guards Parade performing a, a, a feu de jour, if that's the correct French, a kind of gun salute where each soldier fires one after the other creating a sort of barrage of sound. With most people getting the day off, a rare occasion before the introduction of paid holidays and bank holidays, street parties were held across London, with one eyewitness saying that the crowd of citizens from Temple Bar to Leadenhall Street during the whole morning was almost impervious. Uh, even nightfall didn't stop the celebrations. Building across London had been working on illuminated displays, light shows. Light shows had been suggested earlier that year, uh, and in March 1809, tallow chandlers were kind of working to get their stock up. The price of candles actually went up by three pence per pound due to the demand for candles. Um, at a time when gas was still not used very much and candles were the light source for most working people, that can't have been popular, but uh, fortunately the high prices only lasted about a month. The displays in London sound quite impressive, uh, as well as uh, candles and lamp displays and lanterns Transparencies of the King were popular, as well as lighted displays of the King's cipher, GR, or Long Live the King. The Bank of England alone had purchased £19,200 of candles, um, which is about 8,700 kilograms. It took six hours for them to set up their display, which included 18,000 lamps. Lloyd's Coffee House was decorated to look like a ship in sail, with pennants and anchors. The pillars of Mansion House were draped with rows of lamps and decorated with bouquets of flowers, uh, along with oak, thistle, shamrock. Vauxhall Pleasure Gardens illuminations gave it a look of a temple and, and loads of other buildings across London, including people's houses, had light shows. It all sounds very Instagrammable, if Instagram or indeed cameras had been a thing in 1809. There were several charitable funds to help people feel celebratory, uh, sailors who were on ships in port that day were given roast beef and plum pudding, 
along with either one pint of wine or half a pint of rum. The roughly 500 patients at St Bartholomew's Hospital on the day were also given roast beef and plum pudding and a pint of porter. How gutted were you if you were discharged the day before? Even prisoners at the King's Bench Prison were given uh, roasted ox and a pint of porter. Deserters and prisoners of war were pardoned. A hundred debtors were freed. Several children across the country born in 1809 were called George or Jubilee or Charlotte. There's a possibly apocryphal story that a village in Oxfordshire named every child born in 1809 George Jubilee or Charlotte Jubilee. Must have caused a bit of confusion. Um, I did do a quick search on a genealogy website and there are a lot of people in London who were born in 1809 who have the name Jubilee, either, the, either as a first or second name. And Jubilee becomes a popular name, became a popular name again in 1887 and 1897 for Victoria's Jubilees. So uh, pretty hard to lie about your age if your name was Jubilee in the 19th century. Despite his reputation in the United States, George III was quite well liked in Britain um, because of his down-to-earth nature, probably, or perhaps because his son and heir was really not well liked. And people did tend to have sympathy towards him because of his illness. Um, sadly, that sympathy for mental illness was not extended to the poor souls in Bethlehem Royal Hospital at the time. But the popularity of the Jubilee in 1809 may well have been more to do with the day off and the parties and the free pints than any feeling towards George III. So the next two monarchs, uh, King George IV and King William IV, weren't on the throne very long and weren't very popular. So no more Jubilees until Queen Victoria's 50th year on the throne in 1887. Her Golden Jubilee, which was celebrated on the anniversary of her accession 20th of June. As they had for George III's Golden Jubilee, many towns and cities declared the day a holiday and held street parties. Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee was celebrated with a standard part of any Jubilee, the parade and a special service. Victoria's Golden Jubilee was at Westminster Abbey, the service was at the Abbey, most of them tend to be St Paul's. An American author, Mark Twain, watched the parade. He said it was so long it stretched further than the eye could see. One of the guests at the service was the future Queen Lili Uakalana, the last monarch of Hawaii. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, she said that when a beam of sunlight fell on Queen Victoria's head during the service, she took it as a sign of heavenly blessing. After returning to Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria appeared on the balcony and there were fireworks. At the end of the Jubilee Day, Victoria wrote in her diary that she had enjoyed the decorations on Piccadilly and she'd enjoyed seeing the Chelsea pensioners near the arch, presumably referring to Wellington Arch. She also mentioned that she'd enjoyed hearing Te Deum by her darling Albert during the service at the Abbey. Her husband Prince Albert had died in 1861, but Victoria never really stopped mourning him. She had kicked off her Jubilee celebrations that morning with a breakfast outside Frogmore, where Albert was buried, to make sure that his memory was part of the celebration. One of the familiar images of Queen Victoria um, was created for the Golden Jubilee. The Jubilee bust, um, we, we can see here, was sculpted by Francis John Williamson. Numerous copies were made, ending up around the world. It's kind of one of those images of Queen Victoria that you think of. Another long-lasting commemoration of the day was a V-shaped wood um, planted on the South Downs near Lewis, which is south of London. Ten years later, Queen Victoria was still going strong, so it was time for the first Diamond Jubilee in British history in June 1897. The customary Jubilee parade included soldiers from several countries and the Queen and the Royal Family travelling from Buckingham Palace to St Paul's Cathedral. The Queen was suffering from severe arthritis at the time, so the service was conducted outside, so she didn't have to step down from the carriage or climb up the stairs of St Paul's. 1897 was the early days of cinema, and the parade was captured by 40 film companies set up around the route. Um, there's a story that one filmmaker paid £50, a lot of money, for a room which overlooked the route, but when he turned up to film, a stand had been built right outside and completely obscured the window, so... Not good for him. Others did have better luck, and the resulting film, which was seen around the world, made Victoria's Jubilee Parade the most watched event in cinematic history at the time, although cinematic history wasn't very long at the point, but still. The 22nd of June 1897 was declared a bank holiday across Britain, Ireland and India, so many people celebrated their extra day off with street parties. In London and Manchester, tea merchant Thomas Lipton gave out free ale and tobacco to those celebrating. 
I'm sure we've all noticed that Platinum Jubilee souvenirs are everywhere and on everything this year. And it's Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee that was the first to see that flood of souvenirs. Souvenirs had existed at previous Jubilees, including official and non-official medals and mugs and paintings. But they weren't mass produced and they weren't cheap. Um, by the end of the 19th century, though, production methods did make it possible to mass produce cheap items. And 1897 saw Diamond Jubilee plates, mugs, toast racks, clocks, spoons, sweet, sweet tins, sightseer maps, cards, Jubilee adverts for everything from cocoa and paint to porridge oats and tyres. And prices were low enough that even working people could afford them. A child's tin cup was about six pence, which is the equivalent of about one or two pound. Another part of modern jubilees made its debut in 1897 when beacons were lit across the UK and some towns were awarded city status. For Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, it was Nottingham, Bradford and Hull that became cities. The memory of Victoria's beloved Prince Albert still managed to sneak into the festivities. In her official jubilee portrait, she was photographed wearing the lace and veil she'd worn for their wedding in 1840. Long-lasting marks that have been made on London streetscape uh, include the Jubilee Market at Covent Garden. Uh, they started building it in 1897, um, so it was named after the Diamond Jubilee, but it wasn't actually opened until 1904. At the Houses of Parliament, the large square tower where the archives were and are kept was at the time referred to as the King's Tower, but it was renamed Victoria Tower for the Diamond Jubilee. Queen Victoria's grandson, King George V, was the next monarch to hold a jubilee and the first British monarch to hold a silver jubilee, 25 years. Queen Victoria didn't celebrate her 25th year on the throne. Um, in 1862, Victoria was still in self-imposed isolation while recovering from the shock of her husband's death in 1861. George V's jubilee day on 6th of May 1935 was declared a bank holiday and was marked with the now standard carriage procession from Buckingham Palace to St Paul's Cathedral for a Thanksgiving service and lots of street parties and souvenirs with silver jubilee mugs being awarded to every child born on jubilee day. King George V was a popular monarch um, and by popular demand he continued to appear on the balcony at Buckingham Palace and take carriage rides through London for the rest of the month, for the rest of May. A recipe known as Jubilee Chicken was created for the silver silver jubilee consisting of chicken in a kind of curried mayonnaise not dissimilar to coronation chicken which was created for the coronation of george v's granddaughter elizabeth ii in 1953. queen elizabeth ii's golden and diamond jubilees had their own incarnations of jubilee chicken created heston blumenthal did the diamond one but none of them have really beaten the popularity of coronation chicken for this year's platinum jubilee a competition was held to create a jubilee pudding so apparently they've given up on the chicken the winner of the platinum pudding was a lemon Swiss roll and amaretti trifle, created by amateur baker Jenna Melvin from Southport. A couple of London landmarks from George V's Silver Jubilee, the Jubilee Gates in Queen Mary's Gardens in Regent's Park. The gardens were named after George V's wife and were also opened in Jubilee year. And to mark the Silver Jubilee year of 1935, the stretch of the Thames between London Bridge and Westminster Bridge was named the King's Reach. Uh, with a memorial installed near Temple. The next jubilee was the silver jubilee of King George V's granddaughter and our current monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, in 1977. Previous jubilees had attracted criticism because of the amount of money spent. Uh, this had been particularly pointed out for her grandfather's jubilee in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, when many working families were suffering. The 1970s was also a time when many working people were struggling and the cost of living was soaring and Queen Elizabeth II specifically asked to avoid excessive public expenditure for the Silver Jubilee celebrations. But there were still many annual events, although the, 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 the Queen's national and international visits that year and the Queen's official birthday were kind of rebranded as Jubilee events. So they would have happened anyway, but they were still Jubilee events. I guess that saved a bit of money. The, the Silver Jubilee followed very much the same formula as previous Jubilees, with beacons being lit uh, across the country, a procession to St Paul's Cathedral, appearances on the Buckingham Palace balcony and street parties. Uh, there were over 4,000 street parties in London in 1977, uh, along with one on Coronation Street and one on a 1983 episode of Doctor Who. 
A new addition to Jubilee festivities for 1977 was a river flotilla from Greenwich to Lambeth. It was it was intended as a kind of reenactment of the royal progresses made by Queen Elizabeth I. And again, a, a new thing was that London's double-decker buses were decorated in silver. Decorations on buses were re repeated for all the Jubilees to follow. London's streetscape is littered with legacies of the Silver Jubilee. The Jubilee Gardens on the South Bank were opened by the Queen in 1977, complete with the Jubilee flagpole, which had been donated by the Forest Industry of Canada for the Festival of Britain in 1951, which Jubilee Gardens is on the site of. Uh, the flagpole was re-erected by the Government of British Columbia uh, in the New Gardens for the Silver Jubilee. A few years earlier, the remains of a medieval fountain had been discovered in the grounds of the Houses of Parliament, that, that that was preserved, of course, and a new fountain was built on the site and named the Silver Jubilee Fountain. Perhaps the two most notable legacies are the Jubilee Line on the London Underground, which was still under construction in 1977 and then known as the Fleet Line. It was renamed and given its silver colour for the Jubilee. And one of London's most iconic landmarks, uh, Tower Bridge, was given a new colour scheme of red, white and blue. It had been a sort of bluey grey before then, but it's remained red, white and blue ever since. A controversial moment of the Silver Jubilee was the release of God Save the Queen by the Sex Pistols, which was seen as an attack on the Queen and the British people, although the Sex Pistols have always maintained that the lyrics are supposed to elicit sympathy for the working class and resentment towards the upper class in general, and they also claimed they hadn't gone out of their way to coincide with the Jubilee. The song was re-released for all of the Queen's subsequent jubilees with the controversy surrounding it diminishing every single time. The next big jubilee was the Golden Jubilee in 2002, um, Queen Elizabeth II's 50th year on the throne. It, it must have been a difficult year for the Queen. Her sister and her mother had passed away earlier that year, but uh, jubilee celebrations went ahead anyway with the now usual national and international visits, the lighting of beacons, street parties, a procession to St Paul's Cathedral. Although in a slight change to proceedings, um, after the Queen had been on her procession to St Paul's Cathedral, she watched another parade on the Mall featuring a, a, a recreation of the Notting Hill Carnival and representatives from a few Commonwealth countries and charities, military services, emergency services, frontline services, uh, including 100 Transport for London employees. And for the first time, a rock concert was held in the grounds of Buckingham Palace. It was called Party at the Palace and celebrated the past 50 years of music. It included performances by S Club 7, Atomic Kitten, Tom Jones, Top Loader, Shirley Bassey, Ozzy Osbourne, Paul McCartney, with perhaps the most memorable moment, uh, for me anyway, being Brian May of Queen playing a version of God Save the Queen on the roof of Buckingham Palace. That was pretty cool. Since Queen Victoria's day, um, jubilees have often been marked in Commonwealth countries and, and Crown dependencies with varying levels of enthusiasm. But for the Golden Jubilee, rather oddly, it was marked in New York City, where the Empire State Building was lit up in royal purple and gold. Mayor at the time, Michael Bloomberg, said the gesture was a thank you for the Queen and the nation's support in the aftermath of the 9-11 tragedy, and in particular a thank you for the American national anthem being played during a changing of the guard on 13th of September 2001. Ten years later, Elizabeth II became only the second monarch to celebrate a diamond jubilee in the same year that London became the first city to host the Summer Olympics for the third time. And there was all manner of hoopla in London in the summer of 2012. And I took a lot of photos of flags and crowns. I think every Londoner did. To kick off the Diamond Jubilee celebrations, beacons were lit in Commonwealth countries around the world. The first was lit in Tonga, with the final beacon being lit eight hours later in Canada and the Queen lighting the Buckingham Palace beacon somewhere in between the two. The Diamond Jubilee bank holiday weekend consisted of the usual parade, balcony appearances, street parties which were known as the Big Jubilee Lunch for 2012. Perhaps the biggest street party was a picnic in the gardens of Buckingham Palace and a Big Jubilee Lunch on the Mall, which anybody could apply for tickets for. The Golden Jubilee Flotilla was recreated as the Diamond Jubilee River Thames pageant uh, and it became the largest river flotilla on the Thames in 350 years. The Queen and Prince Philip travelled by boats in the flotilla. There were specially cast Royal Jubilee bells being rung on another barge, um, one named for each member of the royal family. It was also the first appearance of the Queen's row barge Gloriana, the first royal barge built in more than 250 years. 
Rather unfortunately for the picnic in the park and the Thames flotilla, uh, the Diamond Jubilee weekend was also marked by torrential rain. Because it's a bank holiday in England and that's what happens. Legacies of the Diamond Jubilee in London include Greenwich receiving royal borough status, reflecting its links to the history of the royal family. Um, elsewhere, Chelmsford, Perth and St Asaph got city status and Armagh was granted a Lord Mayoralty. The Diamond Jubilee will be remembered with a stained glass window in Westminster Hall. Um, the Royal Jubilee Bells um, found a permanent home in the Church of St James Garlic Hyde after their voyage down the Thames. Uh, the Jubilee Gardens that had been opened by the Queen for her Silver Jubilee in 1977 were redeveloped and opened a second time by the Queen for her Diamond Jubilee. And to protect the old legend that if the ravens ever leave the Tower of London, the kingdom will fall, another raven was given to the Tower of London and named Jubilee. Hopefully Jubilee will have a long life at the Tower of London, but when the inevitable happens, he'll be commemorated on the Raven's Memorial in the moat. Perhaps most prominently, and echoing the name of the Victoria Tower at the Houses of Parliament in 1897, the clock tower which houses the bell Big Ben was renamed Elizabeth Tower. Apart from commemorations in Commonwealth countries and Crown dependencies, several British embassies around the world also held big public events, with Brazil holding a model boat flotilla and a big Jubilee lunch. Um, Italy held the Jubilee concert. Um, the, United Arab em the United Arab Emirates um, had a great British car rally. And the USA held a charity run in New York City in Central Park where the fundraisers were invited to run six kilometres, one for every decade of the Queen's reign. 2022 will be the first time that we've celebrated a Platinum Jubilee, the first time a British monarch has reached 70 years on the throne. So it's a historic event, it's never happened before, but there will be a lot of familiarity. The, the 2022 Platinum Jubilee in London, there'll be pageants and street parties and big Jubilee lunch and a concert at Buckingham Palace Thanksgiving service at St Paul's, beacons, scads of souvenirs and colourful buses. So what has the Jubilee ever done for us? Since George III's Jubilee caused the price of candles to rise, there has been concern about the amount of public spending associated with Jubilees, particularly when times are hard for working people. The consumerism of Jubilees has been criticised since Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee when the first mass-produced souvenirs came. And more recently, Banksy voiced concerns with a mural in Wood Green, um, which was a protest against sweatshops being used to manufacture Diamond Jubilee and London Olympics memorabilia in 2012. That can be balanced against the charitable work often done in the name of a Jubilee, from the dinners given to hospital patients at George III's Jubilee in 1809, to the conservation groups which will benefit from the Queen's Green Canopy, a scheme to plant as many trees as possible to celebrate the Platinum Jubilee, and the National Lottery's Platinum Jubilee Fund, which awarded money to community projects across the UK. But whatever the prevailing feeling towards the royal family or the monarch, Jubilees do tend to be popular. In 2002, support for the royal family was, was quite low, and the Jubilee was predicted by a lot of people that it was going to be a damp squib. But it was really popular. Loads of people came out for street parties and for the big public events. Perhaps it's the fact that Jubilees provide a moment to celebrate both local communities with street parties and the nation, meaning that even those who don't particularly follow the monarchy can still enjoy that kind of community spirit. Or perhaps it's that since the London authorities ordered all shops to close um, for the Golden Jubilee of 1809, a Jubilee has tended to be a day off. This must have been particularly precious before bank holidays were a thing and when servants and apprentices rarely had a day off. But even today, one extra paid day off a year is nothing to be sneezed at. And if you get an excuse to eat cakes and drink bubbly, then all the better. And certainly for this year, it's a bit of history. The first platinum jubilee in British history, first 70 years on the throne. And, you know, I don't want to be too depressing and morbid, but Queen Elizabeth II celebrated her 96th birthday in April, so in all likelihood we won't celebrate another jubilee for quite some time. I mean, it's not impossible that the Queen's got another five years in her, but I, I reckon a 75th jubilee is unlikely. And the next monarch, the next monarch who celebrates a jubilee, would have had to be on the throne for 25 years before we get a jubilee. So I'm probably not going to live to see another jubilee, so I'm going to enjoy the community spirit and the partaking in a historic event, and I'm going to raise a glass and a slice of platinum pudding to the Queen's 70th year on the throne. Three cheers for the jubilee.